to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the scripture records of the good king david that at times he was a man after God's own heart. We welcome you today to our study of great Bible characters. As we think today about David, we want to emphasize the good that David did, some of the areas that he could have done better in, and then some of the things that were really ugly in the life of David so that it will help each of us to be closer to Almighty God. Again, we welcome you to our study of great Bible characters. The Gospel of Christ program is brought to you by members of the Church of Christ. Those members of the Lord's Church in your area would love for you to visit their assembly. You'll find people there who love the truth, love the Lord, and are deeply concerned about souls. They'd love to sit down and study the Bible with you. If you've got a Bible question, maybe about the plan of salvation or the one church, they'd love to help you in that area. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we want to help you in your journey as you strive to know more and study more about the Lord's will. We encourage you to visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. You'll find a variety of Bible study material available there. If you'd like to have a copy of any of our lessons available on our website, you can contact us through email or the information given at the end of this program. And if you've got a question that you'd like to maybe have answered or maybe even a lesson done on, please don't hesitate to contact us. We'd be glad to help in any way that we can. As we think today about King David, we think about principles of, of righteousness, principles for life, and practical lessons of both what to do and not to do so that our relationship with God can be better. You know, someone once said, Smart people learn from their own mistakes. Really smart people learn from the mistakes of others. Well, not only can we say that about mistakes, we could say that about right things done as well. I can learn from the good David did. I can learn from the bad and the ugly in his life. And, and in each principle, I can learn it in a way that it can be applied to my life so that I can live faithful to the Lord. Now, as you think about David, what brought David into being king? Because of King Saul's unlawful sacrifice committed in 1 Samuel 13 and his failure to obey God's commands, 1 Samuel 15 verses 21 and 22, God, according to 1 Samuel 13, 14, began to look for an immediate replacement to King Saul. David, in Samuel's estimation, was the most unlikely of all of Jesse's sons to be a replacement for King Saul. He wasn't the tallest, he wasn't the strongest, but he did have the right heart. David's life and his work cover a, a large portion of biblical literature in the Old Testament. The life of David can be found from 1 Samuel 16 through 31, all of 2 Samuel, about 1st and 2nd Kings covers a lot of David's life as well as 1st Chronicles 11 through 29. And so you've got a massive chunk of Old Testament literature on top of the Psalms that deals with the life of David. He is a key figure in Scripture and we want to think about his life and what we can apply for that from that for just a few moments. These following four statements are kind of a summary description of David's life. Maybe his epitaph we might think of. David is aptly known as a man who was a mighty man of war. When we think about David, he was a warrior, a gladiator in many ways. 1 Samuel 16, verse number 18. But at the same time, he's known as the sweet psalmist, poet of Israel. Of David, it was said by Nathan, you are the man, a man called in sin. And the Bible says he was a man 
after God's own heart. What a great compliment. Now, of David, he was a man who died in old age for the most part as a man of God. In fact, David's reign actually became the, the litmus test, the criterion by which all other kings are judged, according to 1 Kings 15, verse number 3. And so let's take just a few moments and let's think about some of the things in David's life that were really good that he did. First, and probably one of the least mentioned of the things David did that was good as it related to God, is David actually spared Saul's life on various occasions. David had already been anointed as king of Israel according to 1 Samuel 16, yet David would not rise up and take that mantle away from Saul because... He revered him as God's anointed, 1 Samuel 24, 6 and 1 Samuel 26, 9. Now, did David have every right to be king? Absolutely. Had God already placed his approval on that? Yes, he had. But God had anointed Saul. Saul was still reigning as king, and the people recognized that. And so for David to rise up and do that, could have been detrimental to some of the people watching or to the view of God's anointed. And so he didn't want to do anything that would detract from people serving God, from God remaining holy, and having that reverence and fear for Him in their lives. And so from David, we learn a great respect and reverence for Almighty God. Friend, when people look at my life, when they look at your life and they, they see Christ, living in us. We want people to see respect for God and holy things. When, when we talk about the Bible, we want people to see the, the respect oozing out of our lips. We want people to see how much love we have for God. When we, when we talk about God Himself, His character, His nature, His promises, we want the respect for the Almighty to be seen in our words, but just not in our words. We want people to see it in our actions. We want what we say to match up to what we do. Just as David tried to do in his life, we want to really live for Christ every day, especially as you think about this. As young people look at other Christians, they're looking to see what a pattern for Christ lived in somebody else's life looks like. Friend, we want them to see this. Jesus said, If any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. A second good thing that David did, and this is probably what David is best known for, is his defeat of the ungodly giant Goliath. You remember the story of David and Goliath. There is this giant of the heathen nation, Goliath by name, and nobody in Israel wants to go up against him. He's huge. He's, he's a big, strong, mighty man of valor. And so the text tells us in 1 Kings 17 or 1 Samuel 17, he goes out every morning and he taunts God's people and he rebels and mocks God. And so David, just a shepherd boy, is going to deliver goods to his brothers who are actually soldiers. He hears this. He's, in, he's, he's made angry. He's incensed by it. And so David says, I'm not going to let this go on. Give me some armor. Let me go out there. He puts the armor on. It doesn't fit. He goes out there anyway as a young lad, five stones and a sling. And God behind him takes that giant down. You know, when you think about David, here's what you learn. This good lesson from the life of David shows us the courage David had and his deep abiding trust in God and His promises. And friend, isn't that a practical lesson for us? What can Christians accomplish with God on their side? The Bible says in Philippians 4 verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, through Him who strengthens me. The question is not what can we accomplish? The question is really what can we not accomplish? There isn't anything beyond our reach if we put our trust and faith in God. And friend, we do have some pretty monumental tasks set before us. Jesus gave us one of the greatest. Do you remember it? Go into all the world. Preach the gospel unto every creature. Mark 16, 15. That's a, a magnificent, monumental task. Can that be accomplished? Only with God can it be accomplished. 
I need the courage to take God at His word, to, to, to do my best, to do what I can to serve Him, and to never let fear or lack of courage get in the way. And then I need the ability, just like David, to trust God's promises. Did God tell His people, you can defeat the heathens, I'm going to give them into your hand, you will win the battle. You bet He did. On numerous occasions, Israel's failure is when they began to look at their foes as bigger than their God. David didn't see that. He didn't see a giant in Goliath. He saw a giant in God. And with God on his side, wasn't anything he couldn't accomplish. Friend, we need to trust in the Almighty. Listen to the words of Hebrews chapter 13. The Bible says, Let your life be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. Why? For the Lord himself has said, I will never, listen to this, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so that you may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can men do to me? Another great promise or blessing David received, and part of the good came from his life, is due to his faithfulness, David received the seed promise, which is ultimately fulfilled in Christ. 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 and through 14, God says to David, there will be one of your seed who will sit on your throne. He'll reign in the house of Judah for forever. Well, who is that? Jesus is that seed of Abraham. Bless all nations, Galatians 3, verses 14 and 15. And it is said of Christ. In Luke chapter 1, verse 32 and 33, you will call his name Jesus. He'll be great. He'll be son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And listen now, direct fulfillment. He will reign over the house of Israel or Judah forever. And so he had that wonderful blessing because he put trust in God that God worked through his family, worked through his lineage to bring Christ into the world. How grateful we are for those who are willing to follow God and look at the good that can be done. Only eternity will know what good can be done in my life and yours if we trust God, if we take him at face value and do what he says. Friend, I also learned from the life of David about kindness and mercy that must be extended to others. David showed great kindness to Mephibosheth, that is the son of Jonathan, although he could have been viewed as an enemy, although he could have been viewed in a, a negative light. This young man who faced a hard life himself brought to the table of David, treated like a son, dealt with in mercy and fairness and kindness and love. What a powerful lesson for us. How does God want me and you to deal with people? We're to deal with them in love. Love your neighbor. Uh, do good to those who use you and those who mistreat you, Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. I, I am to have the a kindness that Christ had. I'm to let the Spirit of Christ rule in me. I'm to be tender-hearted, kind, loving, gentle towards all men. And in view of that, I do it all to give God the honor and the glory. When people look at my life, and if we have the kindness, the love, the sincerity, the hospitality that we ought to have, Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Matthew 5, verse 16. And then, friend, as we think about practical lessons that were good from the life of David, David stands out as a true and faithful prophet of God who ended up writing by inspiration, many of the Psalms and uh, Proverbs, some of the Psalms, some of the uh, writing the Old Testament that we find. You know, when you think about David, David was a man inspired by God. 2 Samuel 23, verse 2, David said, His word was on my tongue. As a prophet, as one who looked in the future through God using him, he faithfully proclaimed and said, what God said. He stood true to the Word of God and he let God use him to speak His Word. Now, let's make practical application to that. As God's people today, if we can learn from David how he was a faithful prophet and man of God, we too need today to be faithful spokespersons of faithful people who are willing to speak God's Word. Remember 2 Timothy 4 verse 2? The Bible says, Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Paul said to Titus, As for you, speak the things which are proper 
for sound doctrine. Titus chapter 2, verse 1. When we speak, let's let our speech be the speech of God. Let's say what God says. Let's, let's speak the truth in love and point, Jesus, point people to Jesus by faithfully proclaiming what He's taught and what He's said. You know, another very practical, and this is a difficult lesson that we learn from David is he's an example of a man who was willing to repent. Was David perfect? Not at all. He had problems in his life, and we'll identify some of those, but in particular, the one that's being spoken of in Psalm 51 is his sin with Bathsheba. He, he committed wrong. He tried to hide it. He did those things that were not pleasing in the sight of God, and yet while we may think about that momentarily, the thing to hone in on as we relate to David's good qualities is he was a man. When he recognized sin, owned up to it, he was willing to repent. Listen to the beautiful words of David in Psalm chapter 51. David said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Psalm 51 verse 3. I acknowledge my transgression. My sin is always before me against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. And so when I think about David's life, I think of a man who was willing to repent. Who among us doesn't need to have that quality? The Bible says all. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3, verse 23. I've made mistakes. I've done things right, wrong, and so have you. And so part of being a person who has the heart after God is when we, when we do wrong, we're willing to repent and make it right. Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Luke chapter 13, verse number 3. Now let's shift gears for just a moment and as we think about David's life, I want to learn from the good and I want to follow that, but I also want to take note of the things he did that were not right and I want to avoid that. One of the things David did that was bad is in violation of the law of God. He multiplied wives which was a direct violation of God's word and wasn't according to the original principle of marriage in Genesis 2. Listen to the words of Deuteronomy chapter 17 where the scripture clearly teaches that kings were not to multiply wives. Deuteronomy 17 verse 17 says this, Principles given to the king says, Neither shall he, the king, multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. And so God said to the king, don't multiply wives. What's God's original pattern? Jesus goes back to it in Matthew 19. He says, from the beginning it was not so. What beginning? For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Did God intend for all these kings to have all these never in his original pattern? Did God allow it? Yeah, Acts 17, verse 30 and 31. These times of ignorance God once overlooked allowed them to continue in it without endorsing it, endorsing it, but it was never a part of His plan. And some of the problems you'll see in David's life and especially, especially, you know, we can't help but read Deuteronomy 17, 17 and think of Solomon. God said, don't multiply wives. They're going to turn your heart away from God. We're now in 1 Samuel, 1 Kings chapter 11. See up there on the hilltop, there's Solomon with his wives worshiping false gods. Proof that it never was God's plan and that it was going to pull them away from the Almighty. And so I want to learn from this that God intended for one man and one woman to remain in that marriage for life. Romans 7 verses 1 through 4, that they're to help one another, to love one another, to encourage, to uplift, to follow the teachings of God, and, and th by doing that, you can have the best life possible. Now, another bad thing that we learned that David did, and I, I don't think it was intentional. I know it wasn't intentional, but it was still bad. David transported the ark of God in an unauthorized way, which led to Uzzah's death. Do you remember the scene in the setting? The people, uh, the enemies have taken over the ark of God, the tabernacle, the ark of God, and now they're asking God's people to take it back because they couldn't handle it. And so it's being sent back and David goes to get it. And the Bible tells us that they, Uzzah and Ahio 
put it on a new cart and they drove it and as they reach a place called Nashon's threshing floor evidently they hit what we might think of as a bump in the road and looks like the ark is going to fall Uzzah loves God he loves the ark he doesn't want it to fall and so he reaches out to stabilize it dies right there on the spot drops dead David's angry he doesn't know what's going on he thinks he's trying to do the right thing and yet in the process of this he had violated the word and the will of God unknowingly. Listen to 1 Chronicles chapter 15 concerning this event. For because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult Him about the proper order. So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. And the children of the Levites bore the ark of God on their shoulders by its poles as Moses had commanded according to the Lord. What do we know about David? David made an error here. Was it intentional? No. But they didn't consult God about the proper order. They didn't look to the Word of God to find out how to transport that. Friend, as we think about this, even though our intention may be to follow God, as David's was, the only way to do that correctly is by following God's Word. That's how God has revealed Himself to us in His Word, the Bible. Now let's turn our attention to the ugly in David's life. And friend, it is ugly in the sense that these things are violations of the will of God, heinous crimes against God and man, and powerful lessons I can learn from in the negative sense of not what not to do. What's the ugliest of all? We turn to 1 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. And we think about David. He's up on the rooftop, a time when kings ought to be out to war. And there he sees beautiful Bathsheba bathing nude. And he desires her. Second Samuel, excuse me. He desires her. He wants to take her as wife. And at the time when he should have been out to war, he finds another man's wife he's attracted to. In 2 Samuel 11, he desires her. In the process, he takes her for his own. Uh, in the process of this adulterous relationship where David and Bathsheba are together, she becomes pregnant. He tries to bring her husband home so that he'll think it's his. He eventually sends him to the front lines and tells him to back away so that he'll be killed. And so you've got, you've got adultery, you've got lying, you've got deception, you've got murder, a, a host of things going on here, all because... He wanted to have another man's wife. David's family suffered greatly because of this sin with Bathsheba. 2 Samuel 12 through 20, the things that go on with Absalom, the, the unrest that was in David's house can be directly related back to this. David sinned against God in doing that. And so we desperately need to realize that this was a violation of God's will and His commands. What do I learn from that? Friend, listen very carefully. You know, we have the expression, the grass is always greener on the other side. But you know that's just not true. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 5, Rejoice with the wife of your youth. If you're always trying to up the ante, you'll never be happy. But if you can find the true joy in two people striving to serve God together and help one another get to heaven, what a wonderful thing. That will be. And so we have the adultery with Bathsheba. We also have David's cover-up, his continued sinful relation. In that, we have him causing her husband uh, to be murdered and having to deal with the consequences and the guilt of that. A host of things that were very ugly back to this one event. And then as you think about David's life and the ugly things in it, David did one other thing that God was deeply upset about. David sinned against God in his unauthorized census of the people. This is recorded in 2 Samuel 24. And as a result of this sin, 70,000 people died in three days. And you know, when you look at those contexts, that context in 2 Samuel 24, it wasn't even that the numbering or the census was the problem. It's that in so doing, it looks like, they were putting their trust in their numbers, not in God. Friend, as we think about trust in God, it's not the numbers, it's not the amount of people, it's not the weaponry, it's not those type of things. It's God. 
who is the true source of our help and our hope. People are going to be hurt. You know, I learned from David's life. When I make bad decisions and you make bad decisions, when we do things that are a direct violation of God's will, it not only hurts us, it hurts others. How do you think Bathsheba felt when she found out her husband was dead? How do you think they both felt when that son died? How do you think David felt for the lying, as a public figure for the lying that he did there, for the deception when the nation found out, and they would, what had happened? What about the 70,000 people who died because David decided to make a census for their own showing? My actions and your actions, although sometimes we think they're independent of ourselves, have deep ramifications with everyone in our life. And so I, I need to think about what I'm doing before I do that. David, a man after God's own heart, teaches us good things we can do in serving God, in following Him, in living after his truth, in trying to have the right heart. And, and we mentioned David did repent of those things. He did get his life right with God. He was man enough to say, I have sinned. I've erred exceedingly. Uh, he said, you know, I'm putting this out before you. Help me deal with it in essence. And so he was big enough to deal with it. And we learn greatly from that. But we also learn, hey, here are some things I don't want to do. I don't want to lie. I don't want to cheat. I want to look after another man's wife. I want to put my trust in God and His Word, and I always want to turn to this book to find out what to do. Friend, we ask you today to seriously consider your own spiritual state. Jesus asked two questions that get to the heart of what our real priority ought to be. Jesus said, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what? shall a man give in exchange for his soul. The most valuable thing you have, my friend, is your soul. That soul will spend eternity somewhere forever. There are only two options, either heaven with God and with Christ, or hell with the devil and all the wicked of eternity. Friend, our encouragement to you is to obey the gospel and become a Christian. If you already believe Jesus is the Son of God, would you be willing to follow that up by making true repentance in your life? Would you confess, I believe Jesus is the Christ? Would you be baptized for the remission of your sins? Wouldn't it be great of us if one day it was said, that's a man who tried to follow the heart of God? You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is taking the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we do and say. And unlike many other religious groups, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.